Okay, folks. Well, hello and, and welcome to another one of our uh, weekly test seminars. It's good to see a nice, nice turnout. Uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce Lucas Cernizak. I'd only recently realized that Lucas is actually a spy with the CIA and has been following me around for much of my life. Lucas comes from Boise, Idaho, which is where I come from. Then he ends up magically at Stry, Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, Panama. We overlap there. And now he's here in Cannes. So anyway, uh, you can read into that whatever you like. Um, Lucas uh, was educated in the U.S. at the University of Utah, University of Idaho, and then did his Ph.D. at uh, ANU here in Australia. And he worked with a very eminent uh, professor, Graham Farquhar, who's possibly the biggest person in sort of plant carbon physiology that I know of. I mean, he really is a huge star there at ANU. Uh, Lucas describes himself as someone that works on leaf gas exchange, and I didn't really know what that meant at all, uh, but photosynthesis, carbon dynamics, water dynamics, all that stuff, which is actually absolutely critical for like life on earth. So gee, those are slightly important things. Lucas was also as a postdoc, and this is when he was in Panama, he, he got a three-year, what's called a Tupper postdoctoral fellowship in Panama, which is the most prestigious of all of the, the STRI, Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute's um, awards that they give. So it's, believe me, it's intensely competitive. He would have been going up against really the best in the world there. Uh, he currently has about 130 publications. He also has held a, a future fellowship, of course, which is excellent. And without further ado, please help me in welcoming Lucas Cernizak. Thank you. Okay, uh, yeah, thanks, Bill, for that nice introduction. And um, yeah, actually, so uh, I'll present some work uh, that go that sort of goes back to my PhD with Graham and that we continue to work on and um, sort of recently made some, some good progress. And so the title of the talk is Unsaturation of the Relative Humidity Inside Leaves Requires a Reimagining of How Leaves Function. That's probably sounds a little bit mysterious, but hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll know what that means. Um, so the question, the question that I want to address is, is that air inside leaves near saturated with water vapor under all conditions? So that's uh, an assumption that we make typically in, in plant um, physiology. And I'll go through the history of uh, how that comes about and, and what its implications are. Um, or can the can the water bit, can the air inside the leaf become unsaturated? That means the relative humidity becomes less than 100 percent, and uh, and that's what we we have been um, studying and measuring, and we demonstrate that in it, and and I'll explain why it requires that we then have a different understanding of how uh, of the functioning of leaves. So this, um, this question of what controls uh, transpiration um, goes back to the early days of, of sort of modern plant physiology. This is uh, from a paper by Charles Darwin's son, Francis Darwin. He studied stomata uh, and stomatal conductance and transpiration. And he says, it's usually assumed that transpiration is regulated by two principal factors, the relative humidity of the air and the degree of aperture of the stomata. So that means the evaporative demand or the, um, how dry the air is and then how open the stomata are. And if it were only those two things that controlled transpiration rate, then there would be uh, the air inside the leaf would be saturated with water vapor. But he says it's not difficult to imagine internal interference with the loss of water. So that's the question is, is there something before the stomata that can uh, partly control the rate of water loss? So um, in order to sort of present the, 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 the question and the, um, the underlying theory, uh, we have to first look at plant water potential. So water potential is, gives us a way to quantify the water status of plant tissues. Um, it's a thermodynamic expression for water status, and it's a measure of free energy available to do work. So the units for water potential are um, can be joules per cubic meter. That's a kind of an intuitive way to think of uh, um, energy per unit volume, but that's, that's equivalent to pressure. So normally we talk about plant water potentials in megapascals, 
And the plant water potential is also closely linked to the water content. So if we were to make a graph of the water potential of a leaf and the sort of relative water content, the two would be, would be closely linked. And the water potential is how we um, understand how water moves through soils and plants and through what's called the soil plant atmosphere continuum. It means from the soil into the roots, through the plant and up into the atmosphere. We, we use these, this, this gradient of water potential to describe that. And so oh, the, the maximum, the highest water potential for any body of water is uh, then is zero megapascals. And any water that has less um, ability to do work has, has less water potential than that. And so it has a negative value. So water potentials are always negative and the water should move from an area of higher water potential to one of, of lower water potential. So, the, so our, our kind of current textbook understanding of, of how water moves through the plant to the atmosphere um, goes back to these early work by uh, Gradman and Van den Honert. And it's nicely um, uh, kind of discussed and presented in this paper by Van den Honert, who refers back to Gradman's um, paper. It's called Water Transport in Plants as a Catenary Process. So a catena is a a chain or a series or sequence of things. Um, and it, it conceptualizes the movement of water through the soil plant atmosphere continuum as one um, where we have, for example, different nodes of, of different water potential and resistances between those. And then the flux of water can be calculated as uh, the, the, the water potential gradient divided by the resistance. Um, for that for that segment. So he says, uh, Gradman's idea was to apply an analog of Ohm's law to this water transport as a whole. It can be applied because it's applicable not only to an electric current, but to any process where its velocity is directly proportional to a potential difference. This is the case in a current of water through capillaries as well as in a diffusion process. So, um, so Van den Honert says, and Gradman say we can describe how water will move through soils and plants into the atmosphere according to an analogy with Ohm's law, sort of an electrical analogy. So this is how, um, how this uh, is presented in this textbook. Um, this is a, a fantastic plant physiology textbook. And um, so two things, uh, the, the first thing I wanna point out is that we can the nice thing about the water potential is that we can quantify it both for liquid water and for, uh, for gaseous phase, for, the, for water vapor. So we can have a continuous series of, of these um, different statuses of the water uh, according to the water potential, whether it's in the liquid phase or in the gaseous phase. And on the right-hand side here, you can see how the water potential relates to the relative humidity. And so 100% relative humidity is, is a water potential of zero megapascals. But then notice that um, for the gaseous phase, uh, as the relative humidity drops below 100%, the water potential rapidly becomes very negative. So, um, so for example, uh, at 99% relative humidity, it's sort of minus one, minus two megapascals. And at 80% relative humidity, it's about minus 30 megapascals. And then look on the, on the other side of the, of the slide uh, at how, um, how we understand this series of water potentials to change as we go from the soil through the roots, through the leaves and to the atmosphere. So, you can see in the soil, a typical water potential might be minus three, minus 0 0.3 megapascals. The root has to be less so that the water moves into it. It's minus 0 0.5 megapascals, and it moves up through the stem, minus 0 0.8. And then all of a sudden, it goes from the leaf internal airspace, which we assume to be minus 0 0.8 megapascals, into the outside air, which is minus 95 megapascals. So there's this a huge, a huge drop in the water potential um, moving from the inside the leaf to the air outside the leaf. And this is another uh, textbook 
Um, this is from the textbook we use uh, in our ecology classes here. So it says, under most physiological conditions, the air within the leaf is at or near saturation, having a relative humidity of about 99%. Again, you can see um, on the bottom what we would uh, understand a leaf water potential, how it would change during the day and as the soil dries. Um, but it gets to about minus 1.5 megapascals, and then that's considered to be the wilting point, and we assume then that the stomata will close and they'll no longer allow the, the leaf to lose water and, and to continue decreasing its, its water potential. And so there's uh, support for this idea that, that leaves should have their water potential um, at such a state that the airspace inside the leaf will be close to saturated. So it's sort of 98, 99% relative humidity. And that comes from uh, a couple of techniques that, that are used to measure uh, water potential of tissues. One is the, the pressure chamber. Um, this is the so-called Schollander pressure chamber. Um, and uh, the way it works is you put a, a leaf into a, a, a chamber here. You can see there's um, a, some tubing going to a, a cylinder of gas, and then you pressurize the chamber, and you sort of carefully look at the, the cut surface of the pediole or the twig, and wait till the you can see the water being pushed out through the xylem, and then look at how much pressure has been applied, and that balance pressure then is assumed equal to the water potential of the of the tissue, and so it's a it's a kind of a a creative way to do this, um, but I think largely consistent with other measurements of water potential, for example, with a, a thermocouple psychrometer. And again, notice the values. So for a, a mesic forest, uh, you can see here, we see leaf water potentials, not much more negative than about minus two megapascals. If you go to some desert plants, you can see more negative values, but, um, but for, for our purposes, we consider that, that the leaves should be uh, around in that range, not much more negative than minus two megapascals or so. Okay, so um, this is a really nice review by Tony Rockwell that came out last year. And, um, and so we can kind of summarize this view, this uh, of, of how water moves through plants to the atmosphere. And so you can see, um, this is a picture of the, of, of the uh, intercellular air spaces in the leaf. Uh, you can see here. And then, um, so those should be, he has it here, 98% relative humidity, which would be equal to minus 2.7 megapascals. Um, and that's in this kind of uh, shell of air. So the intercellular air spaces are 99% relative humidity or so. And then there's this big drop across the stomatal pore um, and outside the leaf is sort of minus 100 megapascals. So that's um, that's how we that's what we learn from textbooks and how and how we model um, the movement of water through through plants. So that the in the late 50s, um, this this idea was taken advantage of for gas exchange by. Um, by, by suggesting that if, if it's the case that the, that the relative humidity inside the leaf is, is saturated, then we could measure the leaf temperature. And because there's a well-defined relationship between temperature and saturation vapor pressure, we could infer what the, the vapor pressure inside the leaf is. And this turns out to be extremely useful for, um, for understanding uh, gas exchange measurements. So, we, when we measure plant gas exchange, we put a leaf inside a cuvette. Uh, air passes through the cuvette, and then we measure the water vapor and CO2 concentrations in the air before the cuvette and afterward. And from that, we can calculate the transpiration rate, how much water was lost from the leaf uh, into the air, and how much CO2 was taken out of the air by the leaf. So we can measure here the, the transpiration rate E. And we can measure the water vapor concentration of the air outside the leaf, uh, the air that comes out of the cuvette. And then if we know what the water vapor concentration inside the leaf is, 
we can calculate what the stomatal conductance has to be. So you can see here, stomatal conductance is transpiration rate divided by the water vapor concentration inside the leaf minus that outside the leaf. So by assuming, by measuring leaf temperature and using the relationship at the bottom of the slide, we can calculate what the water vapor concentration inside the leaf is by making this assumption that it's 100% uh, relative humidity, that it's saturated. So, um, so because the saturation vapor pressure is closely related to temperature in this um, way that we understand and, and can take advantage of. So that uh, gives us a way to, to quantify stomatal conductance, which is really useful for understanding plant behavior, plant adaptations to the environment. And then having that estimate of the conductance from, from the water vapor, we can also calculate the CO2 concentration inside the leaf. And this is another really useful parameter for understanding photosynthesis. It gets used in lots, of, uh, in lots of ways for quantifying photosynthetic capacity and for, um, for modeling uh, uh, gas exchange of plants and ecosystems and for understanding water use efficiency. So, um, so this was a extremely useful um, uh, realization about um, taking advantage of, of uh, the fact that the air inside the leaf was assumed saturated with water vapor. So there are these two really, I think, compelling reasons supporting the, this kind of um, view of, uh, of the soil plant atmosphere continuum, and especially the, the leaf, um, because uh, it's supported by measurements of water potential, by psychrometry and the pressure chamber, and it's just incredibly useful for lots of um, calculations. At the same time, there's uh, a kind of a, a strand of, of literature that I could trace back to, um, to, to similar, a similar time. So this, this is a paper um, by someone who must have been a contemporary of, uh, of Gradman and Van den Honert and um, has made measurements. I won't go through all the, the methods because it would, would take a bit too long, but um, has estimated what the relative humidity inside leaves are uh, of, of lantana, bean, petunia, sunflower. And you can see in the third column over, estimates a relative humidity inside the leaf of 91%, 85%, 89%. So much less than the 100%. And really importantly, so, Again, 80% relative humidity would be equivalent to sort of minus 30 megapascals water potential. 85% is probably minus 25 megapascals. And then on the, on the first column, you can see that the, this is the water potential of the, of the bulk tissue. Here it's in atmospheres, so it's uh, divide by 10 to get to megapascals. So this is equivalent to sort of minus one megapascal less than minus one megapascal of the water potential for the, for the bulk tissue. So this, this is suggesting uh, a, a disconnect, something really different for the, the air inside the leaf compared to the liquid water potential on average, the bulk of the liquid for the, for the leaf. So this is from 1939. And then uh, there's a, there are a series of papers kind of, um, that, that you know, didn't get into the textbooks, but show supporting evidence. This is one by Paul Jarvis and Ralph Slatcher, who were both very influential uh, plant physiologists. Ralph Slatcher was Australia's first chief scientist uh, and, and one of uh, uh, very influential in plant water relations. And so the terminologies, the, the symbols are always changing a bit, but the um, what's graphed on the y-axis is is the relative humidity inside the leaf, uh, the water vapor divided by the saturation uh, vapor pressure. And you can see they, um, in this experiment, show values going from you know, up to 90%, 80%, and this is the transpiration rate. So again, uh, not agreeing with, with what we understand um, according to the sort of canonical viewpoint. And, and then this is one final um, example um, that I'll give. This, this is work by Martin Canny, who was uh, at, um, at ANU in the Research School of Biology. And he had 
a cryo-scanning microscope so we could go um, out to the field or to the laboratory, collect leaves and sort of flash freeze them and then bring them back to the microscope and measure the areas of the cell. So the pictures on the right show a leaf, you can imagine um, planed across the top of the palisade cells. So sort of looking down on the leaf and then um, at, the, at the areas of those, those palisade cells. And he, he took some leaves and equil equilibrated them with different relative humidities, leaf disks. And he made this sort of calibration, which is shown here, which shows the cell area fraction. So the, the cells shrink as the water potential of the leaf declines and as the relative humidity and the air declines. And when he took leaves from the field and applied this calibration, he also uh, inferred relative humidities inside the leaf down to about 90%. So again, much lower than we, we would typically understand. And, uh, and, and so Martin was um, at the ANU and he uh, kind of um, uh, suggested to Chin Wong, who was a longtime collaborator of Graham Farquhar, that, you know, could he do some experiments, some gas exchange experiments and try to get some insight into this, into this question. And so Chin came up with a really interesting way to do this. Um, here you can see the, the gas exchange apparatus. It has uh, two chambers, one on either side of the leaf. So it's measuring independently the gas exchange of the lower side and of the upper side. And then what he does is he, he lowers, decreases the CO2 concentration of the lower side until the, the photosynthetic rate is, the net photosynthetic rate is zero. So at that point, the CO2 concentration in that lower chamber should be similar to the internal CO2 concentration at the lower, in the lower surface of the leaf, lower half of the leaf. And then he increases the vapor pressure deficit, the transpiration rate increases. And what you can see is, we know that the, 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 the CI, the in, intercellular CO2 concentration, it has to be higher on the upper side of the leaf. That's where the CO2 is being fed into the leaf. And then, um, uh, and at the bottom side, it's sort of at its lowest point. We know that because he reduced the CO2 concentration in the lower cuvette until there was no photosynthesis. So that's what you can see at uh, here. We can see that the upper, the, the CI, the, the CO2 concentration in the upper surface of the leaf is more than the lower surface. And then as he increased the vapor pressure deficit, um, you see that the two, the two sort of flip and apparently then the CI in the upper surface is less than the lower surface. And that sort of um, doesn't make sense. Uh, and in fact, um, it's, it can be explained as an artifact of the, the humidity, the assumption of the humidity inside the leaf being 100% not being met and being progressively further violated as the vapor pressure deficit increases or the, the evaporative demand um, inside the cuvette. So, the, the, so that was, I think about 2008, Chin started doing those measurements. And then we finally published uh, a paper last year that, um, that had uh, lots of those data. Um, this is Chin Wong on the left and Graham Farquhar Diego Marquez, who was a postdoc um, working on this topic. And apologies for the table, but we can um, focus on the far right-hand column. You can see the saturation, that's the relative humidity inside the leaf. So 0.95 is 95%. And as you go down the table, the vapor pressure deficit is increasing. And you can see that uh, that, that relative humidity inside the leaf goes down to 80%. Uh, at the highest vapor pressure deficit. And so these are, they're not vapor pressure deficits that are, that are so high that the leaf um, isn't functioning normally. Uh, if you look in the column that says A, that's the photosynthetic rate, it doesn't actually decrease very much. So if we look here, so photosynthesis is doing just fine. It's actually hardly decreasing at all in response to this um, increase in vapor pressure deficit. And in fact, a, a vapor pressure deficit of 20 millimoles per mole is, is not, uh, is, a, is a sort of um, a moderate vapor pressure deficit. Um, the apparent stomatal conductance shows this decrease, but that's, um, that's partly a result of this, uh, the assumption of the 
humidity inside the leaf not being um, not being met. And then on the right hand side, you can see this the sort of telltale sign of that assumption not being met, which is that the the CI the CO2 concentration gradient inside the leaf apparently flips and becomes negative, which again doesn't make sense. And when I um, arrived, oh, I went back to ANU for my future fellowship in about 2010. And then uh, Chin and Graham were working on these experiments. <clears throat> and I decided to look back at some uh, data that I'd collected during my PhD. And here, so again, I have this a gas exchange chamber. The air passes through the chamber, measure the gas concentrations before the chamber and after. And in this case, I also measure the isotopic composition of those gases. And it gives additional constraints to impose on the, on the system. And, and so this graph shows the isotopic composition of the CO2 in the air. Um, and it should be similar to the evaporative side. So it makes sense kind of uh, following that line. And then around about, so VPD is increasing as we go to the right. At some point as the VPD further increases, then um, there's this discrepancy between the expectation and the observation. And again, this could be um, this could be explained as an artifact of the assumption of uh, relative humidity inside the leaf um, no longer being at 100%. So this is some more detail about the experiments. They're, they're pretty complicated and technically challenging, but um, but, but there's not an easy way to, to, to measure the humidity inside the leaf. So, uh, so I also did measurements um, in New Mexico with a colleague, Nate McDowell. He had set up um, an experiment um, with pinion and juniper and had the equipment uh, um, conveniently in this uh, outdoor laboratory, which was sort of in a, a shipping container. And I went there with Nereo Gubierna, who was a, a colleague and we made measurements um, applied this isotopic technique, and we observed also, uh, so again, relative humidity inside the leaf on the y-axis, um, so one being 100%, 0 0.8 being 80%. And again, as the vapor pressure deficit increased, um, we, we inferred that the humidity inside the leaf was dropping well below saturation, so down to about 80%. And I um, did another experiment with some colleagues in Switzerland, and this one uh, was um, took advantage of a, a, a transgenic poplar that had stomata that are paralyzed by um, by putting a gene from from uh, Arabidopsis into the poplar. So this was a colleague that did this. Um, and it, and it interferes with uh, the sensitivity to abscisic acid. So abscisic acid is a, a hormone that's uh, involved in signaling for stomatal closure. And so by disrupting that, the stomata, you can see that the, the ABI transgenic on the right-hand side, uh, whoops, here. So the stomata are sort of, they're a bit bigger, the, the more open and they don't close in response to dry air. So they're, they're sort of paralyzed. You can see also in the images on the right-hand side, um, in order to, to, to make these images, we had to actually detach the leaf, take it to a building next door and put it on a stage under a microscope. And so the wild type poplar, you can see the stomata are closed. Uh, the, the opening, you don't see much of a aperture. But this, um, this transgenic one, the stomata are still open. So even as the leaf dehydrated, the stomata remained open. So um, we made the measurements using, again, with the isotopes. Um, and in this case, so we know that the, that the transgenic poplar leaves dry out inside. The stomata don't close, so they don't maintain um, saturation. The water potential must um, decline, and you can see after exposure to sort of moderate vapor pressure deficits, um, the leaves when we took them out of the cuvette are already damaged um, and dying. And the wild type is, is just fine. So in the, in the wild type, the stomata close, they maintain the transpiration rate, very even, very steady in this case. Um, you can see the blue triangles, whereas um, the, the plants with the paralyzed stomata, as we increase the evaporative demand, the transpiration rate just increases until, um, 
until around about 20 uh, millibars vapor pressure deficit. And then, and then the transpiration sort of rapidly declines and that's where the leaf is dehydrated and, and no longer functioning. So we know that we, we, we can assume that um, the relative humidity inside these leaves is, is, is unsaturating, is dropping below 100%. Um, and when we made the calculations, um, that's what we observed. So those are the red squares. You can see the sort of linear decline in the relative humidity inside the leaf in the, in the transgenic one. Really interestingly, in this case, the wild type poplar uh, doesn't appear to show a trend of, of unsaturation. And there's even some sort of strange looking points over here at the very high vapor pressure deficits, um, which are probably related to a sort of patchy stomatal closure. But so no evidence in the wild type of unsaturation, but we have, we sort of confirmed our, uh, at least qualitative support for our method of, of estimating um, humidity inside the leaf by using the transgenic. So then back at ANU and in about 2018, we made um, uh, measurements with Chin Wong's system with the two gas exchange uh, uh, chambers on either side of the leaf and with the isotopic technique. Um, and we found that they agreed, they both um, showed unsaturation in response to increasing vapor pressure deficit and agreed quantitatively um, really well to our satisfaction with, um, with each other. Okay, so how much impact does it have? Um, you can see on the left-hand side, the intercellular CO2 concentration, the difference between that, which is calculated um, using a LICOR, which is the, the portable photosynthesis system, which makes the assumption of 100% relative humidity inside the leaf. Um, the difference between that and the, and the value that we uh, calculate when correcting for the unsaturation. And it can be reasonably substantial, certainly big enough that, uh, that we would want to take it into account if we could. Um, and you can also see the, the bias uh, in the stomatal conductance measurements as well. So the, the um, I guess the, 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 uh, the mismatch between what we would get by making that assumption and, and what we get when we can correct for it is largest in things that use kind of the re residuals for, um, for making inferences. And one of those, one of those things is, by, is calculating the mesophyll conductance from carbon isotope discrimination. Again, uh, it's probably too much to go into the details, but you can see um, without correction for unsaturation, that's the original data, you get this um, this this um, uh, mistake in the in the inferred mesophyll conductance, whereas when you um, recalculate that with unsaturation taken into account, um, it makes the data make much more sense. And uh, this is a really a really interesting example. So this is again with this transgenic poplar with the paralyzed stomata. So. If we make the, the gas exchange calculations by assuming um, relative humidity inside the leaf of 100%, that gives the, the gray squares at the bottom. You don't see it so much on this, um, the way the graph is, is uh, aligned, but there's a negative slope there. So that would, um, that would suggest that there's a stomatal response to vapor pressure deficit, even with the abscisic acid sensing disrupted. And in fact, there's there's a literature about that um, that that the that the ABA signaling is not the only thing contributing to the stomatal closure response to, to vapor pressure deficit. Uh, but in fact, when we account for the unsaturation, we see something really sort of intriguing and and surprising, which is it appears that the stomatal conductance that the stomatal apertures are increasing um, as the vapor pressure deficit increases. Those are the red squares. And I was scratching my head. I thought this was sort of strange. It turns out it's actually what, um, what, would, what is predicted um, based on the, mechan the mechanical strength of the cell walls of the, the guard cells and the epidermal cells. So the epidermal cells have what's referred to as a mechanical advantage. Their cell walls are stiffer. So as the water potential of the leaf declines, 
Um, if there's no active response, uh, putting um, solutes into the guard cells or taking them out, then the epidermal cells will sort of pull the guard cells along with them as they, as they sort of shrink. And so you can see on the right-hand side, the theoretical prediction uh, and this is uh, work by Peter Franks, who was here at, at JCU. And in fact, we could show that that's, um, that's what we observed. So uh, a, a good, another interesting and important way in which um, having an understanding of the unsaturation is, um, gives a better understanding of, of leaf function. Okay, so do all species show this unsaturation? We know at least that the, the wild type poplar didn't. Uh, so it showed a stomatal response to VPD. You can see it on the right-hand side. Um, closed stomatal closure and apparently no unsaturation. So we still don't, we haven't been able, the experiments are sort of so challenging. We haven't been able to measure, make measurements across a whole wide range of different kinds of plants. But, um, but there's at least an example of uh, a species where the stomatal, the stomata do close. The, the, the response is sensitive enough that they close um, before the humidity inside the leaf drops below, you know, some something like 98%. So back to the, the story that I started telling it at the beginning, can we reconcile um, what must be the, the liquid water potentials, at least at the evaporative sites? Um, so if we have 90% relative humidity, we should have water potentials at the evaporative sites of sort of minus 13 megapascals. Um, so here you can see uh, from, from the, the paper by Chen Wong, these are the relative humidity inside the leaf, 90%. Those are the um, equivalent water potentials, uh, so minus 13 megapascals. And then this is the, the water potential of the bulk leaf tissue measured with a, a thermocouple psychrometer, so the leaf disk taken, put in a psychrometer. It's minus 1.4 megapascals, minus 1.5 megapascals consistent with the thousands of other measurements that have been made of, uh, of whole leaves. And so, so this is why, this is why this sort of line of reasoning that, um, that became our, our main way of interpreting um, leaf water potentials came about because it's, it's really hard to imagine uh, how you could measure the bulk leaf water potential minus two megapascals, but somehow the cell wall where evaporation is taking place is minus 15 megapascals. And there's a passage in Van den Honert's paper from, uh, from 1948. He says, another deduction refers to the possible significance of incipient drying of the cell walls bordering the intercellular spaces of the leaf to reduce materially the transpiration rate, the resistance in these single cell walls negligible before should increase to such an extent that it would become greater than the resistance in all the rest of the plant, which is hard to visualize. So it requires two things. There has to be a, a variable resistance and, and, and something in the, in the cell, in the mesophyll, has to impose a resistance that's suddenly larger than the resistance of the whole pathway from the soil up to that point. So it's... Um, so yeah, so people that, that study water relations and do this biophysical modeling, they don't, they don't like much our results because they're really hard to explain. So, um, so what we envision happens is that, the, that there's a, a plane of saturation that as the vapor pressure deficit increases, it sort of retreats into the leaf um, back to some, to some point where there's probably still saturation, so you can see that shown here on the right-hand side. Um, there's, there's still a saturated zone kind of in the, in the middle of the leaf or near the vascular bundle. Um, but then the relative humidity starts to decrease from that point and decreases through the intercellular airspace. And in fact, the, um, that airspace resistance is, is sufficient to explain the, the drop in humidity. Um, we inferred that from measurements of uh, diffusing noble gases across the leaf. But it still requires uh, something that can, can change the resistance of the mesophyll cells. Um, 
And it requires that the liquid water potential at the evaporative sites is much different than the bulk water potential of the, of the leaf. So aquaporins are a, a logical solution for, for this variable resistance in the, in the mesophyll cell wall and in, in the plasma membranes rather. They can, um, they're, they're membrane bound proteins that facilitate water movement across the membrane and they can open and close um, through uh, me mechanisms like um, phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. There are other mechanisms as well. So we kind of have two, two things outstanding to really, um, to really close the story, I guess. Um, it would be really nice to demonstrate that in fact, aquaporins are functioning in this way that they're um, that they can function on the time scales that are that are required, and it would be nice to actually measure the liquid water potential um, at such a negative value in the cell walls at the evaporative sites, um, and show that that can be different than the the bulk the bulk water potential. So we're uh, we're following up. We're working on both of these things. Um, this is, these are pictures of the aquaporins. So they're only discovered in the early 90s. Uh, and you can see, so it's a, 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 pro, a, a protein, proteins that traverse the membrane, facilitate um, water movement. And you can see in the upper right-hand side here, uh, the closed um, pore. And then when it's phosphorylated, it's open, allows the water to move through. And these um, sort of simulations of the protein structure that show the closure of the of the pore here, and then um, how it's open. So it requires uh, kind of combining um, physiology and gas exchange measurements with uh, molecular biology and other techniques. Um, so it's challenging, but um, but um, hopefully we'll be we'll show some promise. Okay, so what is it? What, why does it matter if if this uh, if what we suggest for how the leaf water relations function, is there any, does that um, have any implication? It, it suggests that, uh, that leaves can maintain their stomata open so they can keep allowing carbon dioxide to diffuse into the leaf to drive photosynthesis, um, but that they can control the transpiration rate by by another mechanism, by increasing the resistance um, to water, to the liquid water movement inside the leaf, presumably through the aquaporins. And so plants are doing this. So it would seem, we, we would suggest anyway that they, they have this, um, this, uh, these, this kind of tool to cope with a drier atmosphere where they can continue to photosynthesize while controlling their transpiration rate. And if we could somehow understand that better and uh, understand um, where and when it's operating, we could select for, um, for that trait in plants um, or by molecular techniques and potentially um, uh, select for crops, uh, varieties that, uh, that are able to maintain high photosynthetic rates in a drier atmosphere. And so because, um, Vapor pressure deficit is increasing with global warming. Um, this could be a really uh, promising avenue for crop breeding in, in the future. Okay, thanks very much. And um, thanks for suffering through uh, hardcore plant physiology.